check one, check two. Check, check, check. This check. is it. Welcome to the Cannabis Coffee Hour with your host, me, Rob Cantrell. Oh my gosh, I have an exciting episode, a great episode, an epic episode. If you're into music, if you're into reggae, if you're into film, if you're into cannabis, this covers all everything and we got some hot coffee but my guest is super cool super interesting super cool to do this podcast uh she is the daughter of the famous filmmaker uh the person that wrote and filmed harder they come we're going to talk about the film harder they come they the harder they come is doing a play version a live version in the new york public theater when we're in manhattan right now we are in the bowels of the theater but i'll let her i'll let her jump on the mic here before i talk too long <laughs> so please give it up for justine henzel Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to be in New York City, um, even though it is Welcome. so cold. I'm, <laughs> I'm an island girl. I was born and raised in Jamaica. So oh, wow. um, the snow yesterday, you know, it was a little disconcerting for me. But I'm loving it. And I'm loving the reason that we are in New York City. It's exciting. It's exciting, and you brought the sun, Justine. You brought the Jamaica sun to us this morning. You saying it's all cold? The sun is like hitting my face. Wait, wait. Uh, when when I was walking up to, uh, it's such a great. The public theater is so dope. Everybody, it is, it iconic. is the yeah iconic mm -hmm. right here. You're right on the cusp of the Lower East Side. You're in the Village, but it's also just a beacon of art. I saw some great concerts at Joe's Pub over here. Um, sure. Um, but yeah, you saw the the first play. Okay, let's let's talk. I, I'm talking too <laughs> fast. So, Justine, you're from Jamaica. Your mm -hmm. father made this movie. Right. This movie put him on the map um, in terms of reggae culture and filmmaking. Absolutely. So. How Did They Come was Jamaica's first feature film ever, right? So yes. it was. It came out 50 years ago, and my father, Perry Hensel, co-wrote, produced, and directed the film. It was his first feature, it was Jamaica's first feature, and it was truly groundbreaking because it was the first time Jamaicans had seen themselves represented on the screen. So it caused a riot the opening night, and there were lines around the block for weeks afterwards and it was really a rapturous response um and my father you know also born in jamaica um went to school in jamaica and he he really felt perry felt that jamaica was the center of the universe he felt it was the most important place and that the people were the most exciting people i um, can dig it the fact that you know the best coffee is in the Blue Mountains and the best ganja is grown in Jamaica also didn't hurt. <laughs> yes, yes. Preach on. It is. I've been to Jamaica and I love the coffee and the Blue Mountain coffee. They sell it for $100 a bag. So you could have made some extra cash bringing that <laughs> over here <laughs> and selling that with the play. But keep, t I mean, this film, yeah, I just watched it again last night. I own a copy. I brought the copy with me. Uh, I remember the first time I saw it, they used to show this at at uh, college towns, like at music venues, at small music venues. Now, I have personal touch is I was born in 1972. All right. And 72 is like a magical year. Anybody that's born in 72, we're Gen X to the core. <laughs> uh, and we saw a lot go down. And especially, you know, reggae culture kind of super splashed around globally in the 70s. Um, and that was with Jimmy Cliff. I mean, you talk, everybody talks Bob Marley, but Jimmy Cliff was like right next to his uh, legacy in a lot of, in, but this film, I mean, it all comes back to Jimmy Cliff in this film and your father's vision. And I did watch it last night. And what's, what I want to portray is like, uh, I have done, been in TV and I've done some film. He casted all Jamaicans. All Jamaican actors, all the shots, all the cast, all the grip, all the camera people. 
It was incredible. He said very early that he had a decision to make. Was he making this film for Jamaicans or was he making it for an overseas market? And he decided he was making it for Jamaicans. Yes. Which meant that his choices, once he had made that decision, his choices were very clear. He actually cast non-actors. He did not have scripted dialogue. He believed in finding the action and bringing the camera to the action. He believed in absolute authenticity before authenticity was a you know, <laughs> phrase that everybody throws around these days. Yeah, so yeah. he, those people were cast for what he called star appeal mm-hmm. and the energy of the character. So we had a dentist, we had an insurance salesman, right? We had all these people who had never been in front of a camera before. Jimmy had never been in front of a camera before. Um, And all of them bring this incredible energy to the screen. And, um, you know, I I firmly believe no actor could have done it better than these people could have. Oh, there is an authenticity. And with Jamaican culture and Jamaicans in general, there is a vibe, uh, just a a bright... uh, just a creative vibe, an improvisational vibe to the film, but using the real Jamaicans and the real people that have never acted before, it does bring like a, a sense of realness to it and a sense of like ownership, I guess what I would say, to Jamaica. Exactly, exactly. I mean, ownership to the point where, you know, people are very, very protective of the film. Um, in, and also, in terms of authenticity, you know, my father as a director and his first AD had to walk around with letters from the police at the time because they were shooting in areas where there was actually a ganja den, where it was actually a place that could be raided by the police, right? And they yeah, were yeah. shooting in these real-life locations at a time when ganja was not decriminalized yes um and so they had a kind of get out of jail free card in their pocket because at any time (laughs) they could be caught you know in the wrong place um so authenticity absolutely yeah there's some great shots of ganja shots in it and i do i'm a big proponent you're actually uh three blocks from the very first new york legal dispensary is down the street housing works Housing Works, and I've uh, I've gone to it, and I've been around. I uh, I started comedy in San Francisco in the '90s, and I kind of saw a cannabis movement open up from outside of California. But I have to say, the Housing Works is great, and one of the brands that I do like is that they have sun-grown outdoor cannabis. Okay, All and right. that's what I dig about Jamaica. Is uh, a lot of the culture has gone to indoor growing and just like really making it as strong and you know. Uh, as much THC as possible, whereas I like it, you know, grown more in the Jamaican style, mm-hmm. out in the outdoors, and mm-hmm. they do have that right down the street, which yeah, is kind of I a mean, trip these I, days. I happen to be coming to the public for rehearsals when Housing Works opened, and I saw these lines and lines, and I was like, what's going on here? Um, <laughs> and I have to tell you, walking around the East Village smells a lot like Jamaica these days, <laughs> with all the ganja in the air. <laughs> I know, I know. I think you're going to have a big hit. Tonight is the, uh, is the I think you're going to have a big hit on your hands, uh, because this is a great film. If you would just want to smoke a spliff with your friends, and check out Harder They Come. It's a great film, but also probably the play is going to be, oh my goodness. So now you have a female director, and tell me about Suzanne Laurie Parks. So So Suzanne Laurie Parks is literally a genius. Like, this woman is incredible. I looked her up. You're right. A a Pulitzer Prize winning, uh, the first African-American woman to get a Pulitzer Prize. Absolutely. She is phenomenal. She's a playwright. She's a musician. She's a composer. She's just an all-around amazing, amazing woman. And many, many years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, I saw one of her plays called Top Dog, Underdog, which is a two-hander. And I said, if I ever brought The Harder They Come musical to New York, 
she is the woman that I wanted to write the book. So she's not the director. She actually wrote the book for it, the script. I saw that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so she and turned around and wrote a book for it because it was always kind of this rough underground movie that kind of took so over she, the world. So she wrote in, in, in theater. So the script is called the book. And she took the movie and made it into a stage musical, added more songs. So there's even more incredible music than the iconic soundtrack songs. So there are more Jimmy Cliff songs in there. Oh my gosh. Susan Laurie Parks wrote three original tracks for it, which are fantastic. Um, so yeah, I mean, the film, as you rightly said, became a cult classic. It played at the Orson Welles Theatre in Cambridge, Massachusetts for over a decade. It played <laughs> at the Elgin Theatre in New York City every Friday and Saturday night for three years in a row. Oh um, my gosh. And so in the 70s, it was an introduction for many people into, you know, as you just said, smoking a spliff and going to experience this other world that they had no idea about. Now, fast forward 50 years, everybody knows about Jamaica. Everybody knows about reggae music, and most people know about ganja. Yeah. Um, but here is a chance for you to experience the film in a whole new way, but on the stage. And whether or not you've seen the film, you're going to come away feeling like you have entered a different world. Um, and of course, it's a musical, so there is incredible singing, incredible music. But there's also really, really strong messaging that's there as well. So you can experience the musical on lots of different levels. Yeah, your dad was very authentic. There is some dark moments in the film and there is violence in the film. And it kind of shows the struggle of, it's, it's a wild struggle. It's between the street and the government and then the music and the artist and the, you know, it's a, uh, to, but to tackle that on stage, some of those things have got to be, you know, there's some really, you know, it's not like a Cheech and Chong film. It's not a funny comedy film. It's a, you know, it's a real deal Holyfield uh, uh, film. And one of the things that I got, I saw a, a, a clip of your father explaining one of the themes, um, but I would like to touch on was like the idea of a country boy going into the big city and those two elements. And you see that in Jamaica as well. And I love Rastafarian, the movement of the natural, of going back to nature and being around open spaces and respecting the waters and the earth and, you know, all of that, you know. But then there is this call of the artist to go into the city. Absolutely. And, you know, Country Boy Comes to Town was a real fish out of water situation, especially back then, 50 years ago, right? They were talking pre-internet here. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So the transition radio towns. was the way that people got information, not the internet, okay? So Jimmy being cast as Ivan was perfect because Jimmy was a country boy from Somerton in St. James, which is near Montego Bay, okay. who made the journey to Kingston to fulfill his dream of becoming a recording artist. And he had. I mean, Jimmy, <laughs> at the time when the film was done, was an established recording artist. Wow. Um, and all the, there are four Jimmy Cliff songs in the soundtrack. The only one that is original to the film is the title track, The Harder They Come. Mm -hmm. um, so he wrote it after a conversation with Perry. He's an incredible lyricist. He wrote that. And the scene in the movie where Jimmy is recording as Ivan, The Harder They Come, is the actual first recording of that song. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it, it, oh it's, my I mean, gosh. Talk about authenticity, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. Um, and then Universal Music, to acknowledge the 50th anniversary, have re released the vinyl. So, all you people out there who love vinyl, Universal Music have re released the soundtrack on vinyl and for the first time have included that live track oh wow so it has a bonus track on the vinyl from universal and it's really really fantastic yeah i remember that scene he's literally like the most spacious desk it's the most raw environment and he's just singing to the track and you can see the melody and everything but it's before all the heavy music and inspiration before it's mixed so yeah that's a powerful powerful scene and yeah i don't mean to give your dad that much props 
Uh, but that's one of his best cuts. I you know? love that scene. I yeah. think it's so if it's so intense and Jimmy is just you know, the the passion is just oozing out of him in that performance. It and I think the brilliance of the director is that he stays on him. You know, many people would have cut that scene short, but he doesn't. He like you're there with Jimmy delivering this song and you're you're on him. Um, you know, it wasn't a real recording studio, it was a real recording. And it's it's tremendously exciting. Uh, I think you understand why you want this character to succeed because, you know, not giving any too many spoilers here, but he does some things that aren't great, but you still are rooting for him because you understand why he's doing these things. And it comes out in the lyrics of the song. And uh, yeah, he goes through so much, like in the movie. Yeah, I don't want to give too much, but yeah, he has to go through, as, I mean, as powerful and passionate as the song, you know, is this triumphant song. But what he has to go through is uh, really humbling. Like when Absolutely. I watched it, I was like, oh, wow. You Absolutely. Know? And, and uh, in the musical... You know, you absolutely, it's, it's, somebody said to me last night after the performance at the public last night, they said, you know, they've watched the film countless times. Um, and, you know, if you're not familiar with Jamaican culture and the struggles, it can take you a few watches to get all the nuances of the film. They said what they appreciated about the musical is that it was a lot more clear. The roadmap and, and, Ivan's journey and arc and the struggles that he's up against were much more clear in the musical for them. Um, and so they found, they thought that it would be just as exciting, but maybe a little more accessible for an audience that was not very familiar with Jamaican culture. I agree. I agree because all the songs are amazing, but then to hear them live that you're like going to a concert, you know, it's exactly. like going to a concert and nowadays concerts, I don't want to stand for two hours. You know, I want to sit down. Right. I want to be entertained. And with reggae, I might smoke a spliff before going into this play. Good. So I don't want to be dance. I want somebody's elbow to hit me in the head. <laughs> I want to sit there and chill and actually see some really great... I mean, in terms... That's the thing about New York is people can complain about New York, about how it's so crazy and, and, and uh, so busy and so many people. But the flip side of it is you get the best artists. So the best actors come from here. The best directors come from here. The best comedians come from here. The best musicians, you know, that can come from anywhere. But there's some really great musicians in New York. It's just one of those things. So, I mean, the actors must be amazing. They're singing and they're also acting. And uh, they got this brilliant director and this awesome material to pull from, you know, oh. It's fantastic. I mean, the talent that is on the stage at the public theater is phenomenal because, yes, to be in a musical, you have to be a triple threat. You have to sing, dance, and act simultaneously. Oh. It's, it's, it blows my mind what these actors can do up there. And then also the public team is phenomenal. I mean, when you just the people behind the stage, the stage managers, just the infrastructure of the public theater it is so nurturing a place for creatives it, it really believes in the creative process it believes in giving the creatives time to explore experiment make the um show breathe yeah new yorkers through. get it yeah in this area gets theater it get it's just been a tradition here with public theater that mm -hmm. yeah the staff here we I, I you know i i gave a shout out to your brother that i have met over the years and uh it, it, that he was coming to town and they just arranged this i thought we were going to be in a coffee shop we're actually in a good well sounded like <laughs> uh uh place right behind the theater so this place is yeah very well run and uh yeah you must be so excited now it's playing like uh, in for the next three weeks, right? This, the, the so run is? we have been in previews okay. um, for a few weeks. The official opening is tonight, which is Wednesday. Um, and it's going to then run to April 2nd. It was already had an extension. The, the runs at the public are quite short because it really is an incubator theater. So you're here to test your work, make it the best thing it can be. And then somebody else has some other great work that needs to come in right behind you. Right, so right. the runs tend to not be so long, but um, 
I would encourage everybody to, if you can, you know, go on the public website and, and get a ticket to see this, you know, as, as you said, you know, have a little smoke beforehand that won't hurt. If you don't smoke, that's all right, too. <laughs> that it's all right, too. It's yeah. It's all right, too. If you want to have a cup of coffee instead, that's cool, too. Um, but come see some incredible talent. Like, you know, what the 50th anniversary for, for me and for the Pencil family was yes to honor Perry, um, who sadly passed away in 2006, but I'm it sorry. was also to honor creativity. And it was to say how, the, the question that we were asking is, can one great piece of art inspire more great pieces of art 50 years later? And it's a resounding yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Um, and so we also commissioned some visual artists, Jamaican visual artists, to do work, which is on display in the mezzanine of the public theatre. So when you come to see the show, you can go and look at that work. Poets wrote um, poems for in celebration of the 50th anniversary. Um, there are remixes in the works for the music. The vinyl oh, wow. was re-released. So it's just showing, again, like all you creatives out there, you make something great. It lives on, and it <laughs> lives on in ways that you can't even imagine. Yeah, and at the time when you're doing it, you're like, am I crazy? I'm sure your dad was setting up those shots, and back then cameras weren't, expe weren't easily accessible. Sound, just getting something edited. You know, I am of the age that I've seen what, you know, I started stand-up comedy in 1999, and you had to pay a film guy just to tape your set you had to get this now everybody could do it on their phone and cut it uh but at the time yeah he must have like what am i you know he knew what he was doing but at the same time he probably didn't know that 50 years from now right. his, his daughter is gonna be uh opening you know the broadway play of this thing you know uh i mean the public theater play with this place is just as cool as broadway um yeah it's it's just amazing it, yeah. it really is i mean um i'm heavily involved in film in Jamaica and you know when young filmmakers are moaning and groaning about you know how hard it is to make film I'm like guys 50 years ago they were filming on actual celluloid right you're talking about huge heavy cameras oh. um, it took three years it took multiple shoots to get this film done you know the the rushes had the film had to be sent to america to be processed to come back so you could see it there were no like rewind and watch what you just shot that was not a concept <laughs> right um it was yeah the incredibly challenging oh yeah 35 millimeter the original one like the dvd that i have uh, the of harder they come yeah it's shot like a that's what's so cool about it that it is di it's with all the local talent but it looks like a real real movie it's you know it looks like a movie. you know a western or something you're like oh my god and yeah i did i've seen it with subtitles so before because mm -hmm. the patois is so heavy sure. but then last night i didn't see it and I didn't catch everything, but you do catch the emotion, of like course. the singing scene. Like there's just, and there's vibes that you can kind of check out uh, that I think, you know, Jamaican culture is just such a creative and a live culture that I, you know, that it should be celebrated. I'm just excited Absolutely. about this. Absolutely. And what I love is, you know, 50 years ago when the film did require subtitles for people to, to understand what people were saying, um, only certain cinemas would show it because if if a film had subtitles back then it was relegated to art house cinema yeah super right? art house you're up against like some french film french yeah films yeah. and 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 you know it was a very very niche audience who would go see a film with subtitles nowadays Everybody watches things with subtitles. They watch Squid Games and they watch Narcos and they watch all these things. And so putting on subtitles is no big deal anymore. No big deal. It was a huge deal 50 years ago, right? Um, the fact that Perry didn't have a score was a big thing. You know, he only used ambient um, background noise and the soundtrack. Oh, that's so cool. So people don't know because they don't miss it. Right. So there's so many things that he did that he was forced to do by lack of resources, but he made up for that with just invention and imagination, you know, 
you know, yeah, you got to work with what you got. You got to work with what That's you got. That's what this podcast, I'm taping this with two live mics on my phone, you know, and I edit it all and I do it every week and it's just my passion project. But I do talk about like, uh, especially these days and in Jamaican culture, like the less you have sometimes makes you more creative. It can and, absolutely do that. I agree. Um, especially with art and especially with film. And yeah, you get into the, like the Hollywood game all of a sudden you're getting casted this way everybody has their you know they're pulling you this way and that way when you're in kind of a smaller community just go for it you know and just try to put it together and who knows what's gonna you know what, how much magic you're gonna capture out there absolutely i mean technology has made things so much easier for the creative yes um, but you still have to be talented, right? You still have to be talented. And, and work hard. And work really hard. So um, Perry's, Perry's energy and vision and legacy lives, lives on. I mean, my, my son um, has created a music app called Cypher. So C-Y-P-H-R, no E. So Cypher is, is on the App Store. And Cypher allows you to have different people upload beats and create tracks on this app from different places in the world. You could be oh. in five different places in the world and collaborate and do one track together, right? Like, so, you know, Perry was pushing the envelope, doing something no one had done 50 years ago. 50 years later, his grandson is doing something that has never been done before either in the furtherance of creatives, in the furtherance of people telling their stories, whether that story is a song, a play, a movie, a poem, a novel, it's all about telling your story and getting your story to an audience. Um, and Cypher does that for music. Perry did that for Jamaica and film and culture. Yes, it's uh, one of the things is people want to be seen. And I think the more creative people that we have in the universe and out there, like, you know, everybody's talking about how hard of a time it is. It is almost a revolutionary time in terms of the creative. If you're into music, if you're into film, if you're into podcasting, if you're into writing, uh, the access is right there. You just have to, like, dig in a little bit and uh, try to get it out um, out there. Uh, just to maybe switch into Jamaica just a little bit, sure. what's the legalization scene like in Jamaica? I know that the country decriminalized maybe like seven years ago, and it was always kind of in within the culture. Ganja was kind of, you know, a part of it. Right. So ganja is now legally decriminalized. So for personal use, you are absolutely allowed to have a certain amount of plants. I think it is five plants for your personal use and carry a certain amount of ganja on your body. So you can no longer be arrested for that. Um, however, if you want to cultivate on a large scale, you do need a license for that. And export is still, you have to um, get a license to export. So it's not legalized, it's decriminalized. And if you want to do things on a big scale, then you do need to go through the Cannabis Licensing Authority. Um, so the CLA is the organization established by the government to regulate the cannabis you know, cultivation and sale in Jamaica. Um, so that exists now. But the, it's, it's, what's really important is, you know, the decriminalization, that, that people who are just smoking on the corner are no longer subject to um, criminal life. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, for me, cannabis is definitely something um, for health reasons and growing older and CBD. But in terms of the drug war and the culture and, you know, um, yeah, just getting arrested for it. I mean, I've talked about it. But I, yeah, I did three nights in jail for just smoking a spliff in 2007 outside of a comedy club here in New York City. And I'd come from California. And that wouldn't happen now. It's a completely far... Wouldn't that happen th now? But they threw me in the holding cell for like, you know, so those type of things, it's great. I do think with government getting involved, especially with the culture of uh, cannabis in Rastafariism in Jamaica, and it's more of a country boy thing. Like, that's how I saw Jamaica when I went over. It reminded me of uh, the mountains of Virginia and the Appalachian Mountains. Mm. It seems like just really, just really earth, you know, strong, small town, like, type of 
but it's got its own little musical thing going on. It sure does. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, I guess I, I know I'm, I had a little bit of ganja before this uh, interview, <laughs> so I'm a little bit all over the place. But uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, I, I get your gist on how it's opening up around the cult around the globe i guess and you're saying and i'm saying that that's i mean my father you know he he said ganja was healing of the nation i agree um and he he did feel very strongly that ganja should be decriminalized it should be legalized um and that it was very therapeutic um for people so he he was a very strong advocate for that um you know he he believed very strongly in Rastafarian principles. Yes. Um, as a young boy in Jamaica, he would go up to Pinnacle, which was the first Rastafarian community, um, as a young boy and, and, and go and listen to, to the elders. So he was very, very heavily influenced from very early um, about the wisdom of being natural and yes. growing your own food and and Perry was an Pay attention to your body exactly yeah. he was an environmentalist, environmentalist again before it was a thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and his second film no place like home actually really sh was about the environment in many different ways I read the book, like there's, is yeah, everybody, Wikipedia, Perry H Hensel, and uh, Justine Hensel, uh, very super creative family. Yeah, your father wrote another book that I'm, I'm like three-fourths away finishing called Power Games. That's right. Which was amazing, and, it, and it's written really well, but he also has, I wouldn't say, you know, it's not, you know, Jack Kerouac, it, has, it doesn't, it's not structured. Mm -hmm. You know, it's full of passion. And written, the, the characters are in 3D, especially, uh, yeah, he gets to the heart of characters. I think he starts with the characters. Absolutely. He was, his, and works his way his out. stories were character driven. He, he said he had three stories to tell. One, which was A Country Boy Comes to Town, which is, of course, The Harder They Come. His second film, which was A City Woman Comes to the Country, which was actually the story of No Place Like Home, which is a New York advertising executive woman who comes to Jamaica to make a commercial and then has to go and find her star who was run off. So then it's about this New York City woman finding herself while discovering Jamaica. Yeah. And then his third story was the clash of the country and the city, which is the story of Power Game, which is a novel that you're reading right now. Yes, yes, that should be a screenplay. It, it reads it exactly reads, like a screenplay. It reads like, I think it reads like a series, yeah. Yeah, 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 you know? a streaming series. Yeah, we Absolutely. should get, get that out, up and out there. It's, uh, it's definitely got everything harder they come, and it definitely has, like, the ganja business, the music business, like that, that that's the cool thing about Harder They Come is that he his themes are personal and it and Ivan's a you know, you could yeah, Jimmy Cliff is has this cool star power to him. And it's Incredible. not and he's not like your traditional dreadlock type dude. He's just like a regular dude, but when he sings, it's just this super powerful, cool message. Like his songs, like he's played with the Grateful Dead, like he's gone on, his career is just as big as Bob Marley is, you know, his career is no joke. Like, no. how big of a superstar was yes. he already? You're saying he was already big in Jamaica. Yes. And this film kind of brought him, would you say, to America? Was he a known in America, would yeah, you so, say? So, reggae wasn't known. So, yeah, yeah, he in was 72. Big in Jamaica, but then this film took reggae Jimmy to the UK, to the US. And then Bob, um, his albums were being released on Island Records and he was starting to tour and so it was really a one-two punch you know you had How Did They Come and Jimmy Cliff and you had Bob Marley and those two things got reggae to the world and the How Did They Come soundtrack is like a reggae sampler right so it's not all the same type of music not at all i mean johnny too bad and many rivers to cross are two completely different types of jamaican music yeah where are you going with that ratchet in your hand exactly <laughs> exactly right so yeah. you know it was able to to make people understand that jamaican music they're they're if you like a ballad, we have ballads. If you like something that... Many Rivers to Cross, yeah. yeah. Incredible, Sitting in Limbo. What a oh, oh. blow your mind song. 
you know. It um, is the ultimate mixtape. The hemp tones are on it, right? Right, the hemp tones are it, on it with um and and so it really is in fact the the um, US Library of Congress inducted it into their library 2 years ago. Um, and it's only the second reggae album to ever be inducted into the Library of Congress. And it says, you know, because it's historically, culturally significant to the country. And the country they're talking about is America. They're not talking that this is significant to Jamaica. This is the U.S. Library of Congress. And I thought that that was really an incredible um, acknowledgement of the strength of this soundtrack and how it bridged the gap. And your dad's film, though. I mean, yeah, it, you're you're a hundred percent right. But yeah, for America, that was my first experience, I guess, with the Jamaican culture. Right. And in the eighties, people talk like Bob Marley. Bob Marley was like was college music. So if you weren't, if your parents didn't go to college or anything like that, like you weren't exposed to Bob Marley until like eighty eight and eighty nine. But back then. But I remember seeing your dad's film, How Do They Come, play in Charlottesville, Virginia, at this like little where they would have rock bands called Tracks, and they would go, and people would watch it. People would be smoking spliffs in there, and it was like, I mean, opening into a great country which is Jamaica, which I think there's a lot to be learned uh, in terms of music. You know, as a as a person that loves music, and I'm gonna let you go. I promise, I'm gonna <laughs> let you go. Because uh, you've been too cool, and we're at 35 minutes, and I don't want to stretch your time. But uh, I th- what you said about your dad shooting uh, Harder They Come, how it wasn't scored, that he used background music. Mm. And if you've been to Jamaica, it is a very musical place. Like, everybody's playing, every little town, somebody's playing a radio, or it's at the local bar. Like, there's always... And I always try to keep my ear open, like, oh, what's he playing back there? Sure. Like, what is that, you know? Yeah, every shop, every car, every home, um, there's music, every church. Um, so it's it's an incredibly vibrant, incredibly vibrant culture. And um, Perry felt blessed to be born Jamaican. And, and as a what family, a we yeah. feel blessed to be born Jamaican. And, you know, it is part of our legacy that he has left us to tell people Jamaica's cool Jamaica's amazing oh Jamaica's cool (laughs) Jamaicans are the coolest and very diverse and very just a level of respect towards music and arts is what I felt and just a cool laid back attitude but you don't mess around you don't want to mess around with jamaica no, we, we demand it's a tough a certain place level of respect yeah we, it's, we definitely demand a certain level of respect um you know we we have a, a phrase in jamaica that we're little but we talawa um which means we're little but don't discount us yeah. um and everybody who knows about track and field knows about that <laughs> uh, you know, um, and bobsledding uh, yeah. And, yeah exactly exactly so it's 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 a it's a blessed island um and you and know, you were born there yeah my both my parents were born there i was born there my children were born there um did you see bob marley i talked to your dad he said or not your dad your brother Mm -hmm. did you get to see bob marley live only one we'll close the close it out with that for the cannabis cup what was that vibe like do you remember what went down really young okay really really young young. um but no i mean you kingston in kingston um and there you cannot miss the magnetism and intensity of a Jamaican stage show. So you can't get to Jamaica to see a reggae show right now, but you can make it to the public theater to see reggae. Yeah, 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 you can. You know, it's it's a lot closer. It's this, you will get the Bob Marley and Kingston vibe, uh, Jimmy Cliff and and Kingston vibe if you come to this show, Harder They Come at the Public Theater. You can check it out on the website. The Public Theater website has tickets and uh, yeah. Not many tickets. We're pretty sold out, but go check it anyway. Yeah, check it anyway. Uh, buy the soundtrack, stream it, look out for the new vinyl release, and then if this play takes off around the world, go check it out. Absolutely. All Next right. Next stop, Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the truth. Next stop, let's put it out there into the universe. Yes. Peace and love, Ja. Uh, thank you so much, Justine. Thank you. You're thank too cool you. to do this. This oh, is opening appreciate night, appreciate so I'll it. let you go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.